We have reached the last session of this conference, Solution-Based Journalism. As you may know, Solution-Based Journalism is leading a global shift in journalism. It focuses on investigating and presenting potential solutions to societal challenges, aiming to inspire action and positive change. Konturatu orduko iritsi gara azken saiora. Konponbideetan oinarritutako kazetaritza zarituko gara segidan. Kazetaritza mota hau aldaketa eragiten ari da industrian. Gizarte mailako erronkentzako konponbideak aurkesten ditu, aldaketa positiboak eragiteko asmoz. Let's welcome to the stage our speakers Christina Johanneson and Marcus Melinder from SVT and Aida Anna Hogan from NRK. In the final minutes of this session, we will open the floor for a Q&A and Zoran Medved from RTVSLO will be handling the questions. Chalo vero bat Our colleagues from Sweden, Christina Johannesson and Markus Melinder, will open this round. Both of them work for SVT, the Swedish Public Service Broadcaster, and today they will talk to us about constructive news at, at, at SVT, whenever you two are ready. Thank you. A while ago, I was sitting on a bus in Stockholm, and I overheard this conversation. It was a man sitting next to me, and he was talking on the phone. And he said, stop watching SVT. He was talking to someone close to him, and he said, you have to turn off the news. We've talked about this. You can't take it. It makes you depressed and it makes you feel bad. My ears opened. And he said to her, because it was a her, I can hear her very upset voice at the same time. And he said, but isn't there anything else on the telly? Why can't you just watch um, a reality show or something? Something nice. Uh, this man is not alone. We can see in the surveys, this is from the last survey at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, that one third of the Swedish audience say that they often or sometimes actively avoid news. That's a quite steep rise from just a few years back. In 2019, it was just one fifth. So there's something happening. Uh, this is actually not really a surprise to us, as I'm sure it's not to you either. We have heard this for a long time. SVT have had a project where hundreds of co-workers, reporters and editors and others, have been sitting at kitchen tables, working places and schools, and listened to the audience and asked them for feedback and what they think about news. There's one thing that has united all the groups that we've met, and we have met thousands and thousands of people. They can't stand the fact that the news is so filled with violence, crime, conflict, war, corruption, a lot of bad, bad portraits, which are important. But they say to us, in different words and in different levels of intensity, that you picture the world as a horrible place. Um, and this is something we've been talking about for a long time. I'm sure you have as well. But now this is a, an important part of the strategy of the whole company of SVT. One of the pillars we are talking about is that we need to develop our journalism, to develop factual and constructive journalism that provides more perspectives. And what could that be? There is no real adopted definition on what is constructive journalism. I've heard many different, and we are not finished yet at SVT either. So this is a work in progress, but to us, at this moment, 
uh, our constructive journalism describes the solution to a problem that affects many. The solution must be verifiable. It can not just be an idea. And this does not mean that we are replacing journalism that is also very important. SVT still put a lot of emphasis on breaking news journalism, where the focus is now, where the uh, attitude is there's something dramatic happening that you need to pay attention to, uh, and where speed is really important. Of course, we also put a lot of emphasis on investigative journalism, where the time frame is yesterday, where we are looking at accountability and where we are asking questions like who and why. It's a critical approach, as all journalism should be. And what is the difference now is that we are adding another perspective, the tomorrow perspective, where we uh, are trying to engage and give perspective not to shut our eyes to the problem, but also to look at alternatives and solutions. And we are asking questions like, what now? What's next? And it's a curious attitude. Uh, this has made us experiment in different formats, like programs. We know that there's a lot to be done when it comes to political debate, for instance. Uh, this is also something that we hear from the audience. They are not longing for more politicians that are at each other's throat, criticizing each other, blaming others for the problems that we see. They are looking for hope, for possible solutions. So some of the formats that we have tried are political debates where politicians are not allowed to criticize their opponents but only to talk about what they will do to make it better. And where we also invite scientists and experts who can give a picture on what is actually the facts. Uh, right now, this spring, we have tried a format on climate. This is uh, to interpret it, the climate hope. But it's also one thing that we have been thinking a lot about, because we have been talking about this for 10 years at least. <laughs> and I know that many of you have as well. And it, somehow we have had classes and seminars, and it has just not really made any difference. So one insight uh, is that leadership is extremely important to make this happen. Culture is not something that is just changing itself in the newsroom. So uh, it's important for us that that leaders on quite senior levels are really, really committed to this. Uh, this is some pictures from this spring when we had a massive class with a hundred of, of uh, leaders like producers, managers, both from SVT but also from our commercial colleagues in Sweden. Because this is not a problem only for us, it's for the whole business. Uh, and it's also important to reward uh, the type of journalism that we are looking for. And uh, that's also something that we do with constructive journalism. This is the SVT News Prize that actually started as a way to find candidates for the Sircom Prize. Congratulations to a great gala yesterday. Um, but also we invite prize winners on a different magnitude. Uh, the last Pulitzer Prize winner in the local category, Cecilia Reyes, won the prize due to a thorough investigation on lethal fires in Chicago, but also added the constructive uh, perspective. I can recommend you to listen to her if you are interested in this subject. And this is a little clip from our um, prize ceremony and one example of a, it's not uh, uh, very recent, but it's a, an example of constructive journalism. När 76-åriga Margareta Salin insjuknade i covid i mars förstod hon inte riktigt själv hur illa läget var. 
Men Margareta kom in till sjukhuset i tid. Hon fångades upp av ett nytt arbetssätt som har utvecklats i Region Jönköping för att identifiera riskpatienter innan de behöver intensivvård. Och hur är det med anfodhet? Har du känt någon anfodhet eller har du klarat dig från det nu i sista tiden? SVT Nyheter Riks för ett hoppfullt reportage om en ny metod som räddat Margaretas och andra covid-sjukas liv. Det var en sån trygghet. Både för mig och min man som ju också hade covid. Att känna att här är det människor som bryr sig. De bara inte sa att ja men då får ni sköta er själva utan vi fortsätter och ringer. Så det är en exempel. Men hur gör det i realiteten? Och hur gör det på en liten lokal newsroom? Uh, I'll give the floor to Marcus Melinder, who is the editor-in-chief of SVT Nyheter Norrbotten. Thank you very much. Happy to be here and uh, share some of uh, my insights from uh, working with uh, constructive and solution-based journalism for uh, or slightly over uh, a year now. Uh, I will start with saying that solution-based journalism isn't hard. It, it isn't uh, difficult in any way. It just um, requires a different mindset in some way. Uh, some of you already do this, this uh, at your newsrooms uh, already, I, I'm sure. But maybe you don't call it solution-based journalism. So I will... Uh, Try to be uh, specific uh, uh, so you can have uh, some um, takeaways from this uh, uh, speech that I'm giving you uh, on how we implement constructive journalism in our local newsroom. I should say that we are located in the far north of Sweden. Uh, Norrbotten is a very uh, uh, great uh, vast area. It um, comprises uh, one-fourth of uh, all of Sweden, uh, but it's only populated by 250,000 people. Um, okay, uh, as I said, we have been working uh, quite uh, consistently with uh, constructive journalism for quite some time now. And we always strive to have a constructive part in every in-depth news story. As you heard earlier, SVT is very uh, online driven. We, we uh, work online first and we do uh, these clips for uh, our website. Um, and uh, usually uh, an in-depth news story comprises of three uh, uh, videos, and one of them uh, we try to have a constructive per perspective. Which questions are raised within you during the work? That's a question for our reporters. If you, uh, if you get some questions during uh, your work with uh, this uh, story, I'm sure the same questions are raised uh, within the audience. We try to have one constructive question in each interview. It doesn't have to be that the whole clip is constructive in, in, in that manner, but one question, what can you agree on? Uh, how can you move forward from here? Uh, do, you, do, you, do you see a, a solution to, to this problem yourself? Apply a critical approach to your case. That's also constructive. You know, to, to treat your cases uh, with uh, uh, respect and as adults. Oftentimes when we report on, uh, on something, uh, someone is uh, having a problem with uh, the authorities or something, we, we tend to uh, uh, don't ask them how they themselves can uh, uh, manage to get out of uh, uh, a situation. We work with three constructive key elements for our reporters. The comparison, the solution, and the answer. And I will go uh, through uh, these very briefly here. Uh, the comparison, uh, 
property tax on wind turbines. Um, the location of wind turbines is a recurring question in Sweden. Uh, in Finland, uh, our neighboring country, the municipalities there harbors wind turbines. Uh, the, the, the municipalities that harbors wind turbines receives property tax for each generator. But this is not the case in Sweden, not yet, anyway. Could this be uh, something for, for us to take after? And we did this clip. Det skulle inte förändra min inställning till att bygga vid natursköna lägen där du har besök om de boende. Däremot definitivt längre bort från bebyggelse om du har den möjligheten att få en fastighetsskatt att den kommun där du har snurrarna får också någonting tillbaka. Här på Loppjobberget har en internationell turistanläggning nyligen inbyggts strax före jul. Tornälven här nedanför, det är ju en gränsälv till Finland. Och på två ställen här på andra sidan så planeras det för vindkraftsparker, men de har inte fått tillstånd än. Det här är någonting som de finska kommunerna tjänar pengar på. Men Övertorne och kommun här i Sverige, de motsätter sig planerna. Kommer jag anläggas på berget på andra sidan, andra sidan älven och Det är faktiskt ganska nära fågelvägen. Det blir alldeles för stor påverkan på, på kulturlandskapet. Det är ett Natura 2000-område. Besöksnäringen kommer att påverka. Speciellt den här anläggningen här på Loppiåberget. Den kommer att ha dem i ögonen. Ja, på andra sidan Tornälven i Finland ligger då Yllitorgenio. I den här lilla kommunen så har ett bolag ansökt om att få bygga de där 12 vindkraftverken som syns från Loppiåberget. Kommundirektören här hon vill inte träffa oss, men hon skriver i ett sms att naturligtvis behöver kommunen pengarna. Så vi reser vidare till Tornio kommun. Där finns planer på 50 vindkraftverk mitt emot Risudden. Och vi frågar kommundirektören hur mycket de räknar med att tjäna på de vindkraftverken per år. Ja, ja vi har kalkulerat det och... och uh... Kommunerna i Finland får fastighetsskatt från vindmullar. Och det är Karhakamas vindmullparken vad vi talar nu om. Och det skulle vara 3 miljoner euro per år. Ja. Och det innebär ungefär 32 miljoner svenska kronor då? Ja, ungefär. Ja. Jag skulle ljuga om jag säger att vi inte behöver dessa pengar. The comparison identifies a problem, how have others solved this problem, can we or why don't we do it the same way? Uh, the answer, as I told you, um, what, what, what questions are raised with you uh, when you uh, um, work uh, on a story? Uh, the answer, the, that's facts, factual information, talk of the town, hot topic, and we investigate and we uh, tell it to the public more exhaustive than a fact box. Uh, we did a piece on uh, how to use the, the coverage for, for your mouth uh, during the uh, COVID um, pandemic. Uh, very straightforward. They uh, had done uh, research uh, at the local university about how uh, this uh, coverage, uh, th these masks really works. And it was uh, very, um, Engaging among uh, the, the, the audience were very interested in this because it was a very, very hot topic naturally during the pandemic. And then we have the solution. Can we, it, it's very closely related to uh, the comparison, uh, but the solution is more like um, uh, we, there we also have a problem, but someone has. Uh, sold it in a, a, a special way or, or something. It's, it's not necessarily that you can uh, directly uh, transfer it to your, to your own uh, business or something. So how to use heat for cultivating in cold climate? Uh, it's very cold up in Norrbotten, uh, and, um, but we have uh, uh, several data centers. Facebook has uh, data centers and servers and so on. And they uh, emit heat 
straight into the air, corresponding to the heating of 20,000 villas. But one solution is to use this heat for heating greenhouses. Uh, uh, we, we, we have a problem with uh, cultivating in, in cold climates, uh, as you understand. And this way you can cultivate in cold climate. And I think I will be able to... So, so here it looks out. I just clip it off persilia to a restaurant in the city. Det som är det speciella är att vi använder oss av spillvärme från ett forskningsdatacenter. Och med hjälp av det så tar vi värmen som produceras där och transporterar det in till odlingen för att värma upp den. Alla datacenter egentligen här uppe i Norrbotten försöker hitta sätt att använda den värmen som produceras. Och har väl inte hittat någonting än så länge som de faktiskt använder den till. Så vår förhoppning är att vi ska kunna koppla på vår odling till någon av dessa serverhallarna ganska snabbt. Hur stor skulle den bli då? Ja, du. Eh, vår plan är väl att försöka hitta ett sätt att Norrbotten ska kunna bli mer självförsörjande. Så att kunna placera sig ute vid de datacenterna som finns. Vad är det där för någonting? Här är en stor pack choy. Så Det som är bra med kol är att det kan bli maträtter också, inte bara sallad. Hallå! Hej! Hey. Här kommer jag lite grann saker. Gud vad härligt! Hey. Lite persilja, lite pack choy ja. har vi idag. Trevligt. Ja, men det ser helt fantastiskt ut, verkligen. Har ni använt de här grönsakerna tidigare? Det har vi. De har varit superfina, fräscha och hållit väldigt bra kvalitet. Så det är kul att de är närproducerade. The solution, uh, a clear and identifiable problem. Lots of heat disappears to no use. A clear solution, waste heat, can be used to heat greenhouses for cultivation in cold climates forward-looking and constructive. And that was all. Thank you. Thank you. And also from the north, from Norway this time, we have Aidana Hogen, Head of Editorial Innovation at NRK. She will enlighten us on cultivating a more comprehensive and constructive perspective of the news, taking hope as a core strategy. Chalo vero bat berarentzat. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I thought I would tell a bit about how we at NRK has worked to implement hope as a part of our publishing strategy and how we have built a constructive culture in uh, the whole of our organization. But I would like to start by showing you a clip of what it actually looks like. Och hvis vi nu bara lägger allt detta bort, prövar att finna ut av vad er vi egentligen är eniga om, var är det lösningarna ligger? Debattreglerna är snudd upp ner. Min jobb är att se om de kan närma sig varandra istället för att driva dig ifrån varandra. Fusionskraft är att lägga maten solen producerar energi på och kan bli lösningen på alla våra klima- och energiutmaningar. Gånger är det små ting som ska till för att göra ett vanskligt liv lite bättre. Silje må leva med den speciella benskörheten resten av livet. Men det sätter inte en stopper för framtidsplanerna till 17-åringen. Är det nå de nästa 10 minuterna där i publiken som tar över för det nu ska vi ställa frågor till dig statsminister Erna Solberg välkommen. Kan det komma något positivt ut av detta i så fall vad hoppas det är kanske. So these stories are quite different from what we uh, usually do in our newsrooms. We have uh, crisis, wars, conflict, polarizing figures, and uh, a very conflict-oriented way of reporting the news. And we see that people get tired of it. We even have editors saying stuff like this. I understand that the audience can't take it anymore. I hardly have the energy to read news myself. I'll let him stay anonymous, but I mean, when this is happening in our newsroom, what about our audiences? 
And we see from the Reuters digital uh, news report that in the US, 42% say that they are avoid news. In the UK, it's 46%. And in Brazil, the number was 54%. In Norway, as of now, the numbers are not as high, but we see that 18% of people between 18 and 24 avoid news. And when we ask them why they do it, they say stuff like this. I get depressed about it. I feel helpless. I can't do anything about it. And it leads to discussions I would rather avoid. In addition to that, we see that young people in Norway uh, worry about a wide range uh, of topics, such as feeling lonely and the long-term consequences of the war. So what we started to do uh, a few years back in the NRK was that we looked at our publishing strategy uh, to uh, be able to um, show people that you can look at the uh, world with two eyes. You can have two thoughts in your head at once, both uh, a positive perspective and uh, reporting on crisis. So what we did was, and this is going to, it would sound better in Norwegian, but bear with me, we introduced the quadruple H's in our publishing strategy. We said that we want to reach you and engage the head. <laughs> we want to touch your heart, and we want to do it with hope and humor. So uh, this was the publishing strategy, but then it was time to implement it. How do we get the whole or organization to actually understand what we mean when we talk about hope? And what we said saw came up a lot of the times, both with the journalists and uh, our editors, was, is it just happy stories? Aren't we supposed to be critical? Is it our job to report on the problems in the world? And that's true, uh, but we still need to look at solutions and a more constructive way of reporting. And we were going to implement this, and we were doing stories here and there, but we wasn't getting it into the whole organization. And then the pandemic hit. And it became even harder to report on something that was hopeful, especially when we saw uh, a mental health crisis uh, amongst our younger audiences, uh, and we kept reporting on the crisis, on the pandemic, and on the problems the pandemic was causing. But I've learned that you should never waste a good crisis, and we had reporters that saw an opportunity in the pandemic. This is uh, Ingrid, she is now our constructive editor. And on a very bleak Monday during the pandemic, she had enough, and she said, we just have to do something. We can't keep reporting on uh, stories that make people sick. So she uh, got some uh, developers together, and in, after four weeks, we launched what was called an Lyspunkt. That was a site where we gathered all of our positive news, the constructive news, and tried to give people uh, sort of a, a breathing room during the pandemic. And we saw that it uh, was very well received. Uh, it got 3 million page views, which is quite good in Norway, considering we're about 5 million people. It was 1 million unique users, and it, the content reached younger than the rest of the NRK. But we also saw in the feedback we got that this mattered to the audience. I love it, reading all the headlines made me cry. So we were fulfilling, uh, we, we were giving the audiences uh, a bigger value, you could say. But this was still something that was uh, in addition to and not a core part of our newsrooms. So we gathered a task force that set out to define what constructive journalism at NRK should be. And they came up with this definition. Constructive journalism at NRK shall strengthen and develop the democracy by showing a more nuanced image of the world, pointing at solutions, and fight polarization and create dialogue with and between people. There were quite a, a debate about what we were going to call it, but we landed on uh, uh, constructive journalism and saying that solution-based journalism is just a part of it. We also need to talk about dialogue, 
democratic debate and nuanced information and explanation, and see all of this as part of the constructive journalism. So our goal was to uh, uh, implement this across NRK from the main strategy and the quadruple H's, two morning meetings and the talks at the water cooler in order to create a constructive culture. And now it's been one year since we did this, and we would like to say that constructive journalism now is a part of our DNA. We have, uh, as of this year, implemented the um, strategy in all of our newsrooms, in the drama department, our entertainment uh, department, and in all the local uh, news offices. So this is something that the whole of NRK uh, think about. And then I'm going to show you some examples on what it can be. Uh, this is a story about um, a small town in Norway called Flor. It lives 1,000 people there. And when the war broke out, they were asked to house 200 uh, Ukrainian refugees. And uh, in an, what we would usually do uh, was to find who thinks this is a good idea and who sees the problems and create a normal news story. That was not what we did this time. We focused on um, how this small town were working to create uh, good solutions uh, together. And this is uh, Caroline, Caroline and Benedicta who wrote the story. And I asked her how she uh, came... Caroline, I asked her how she came about doing the story in this way. And she said, we never thought about doing a story about the things that weren't working. And to be honest, we never saw them either. When we got to floor, we were impressed. Everyone were doing everything they could to include support and help. Uh, and we saw from the responses we got that this mattered. This way of telling uh, stories had an impact. One of the feedbacks we got was maybe we're about to change our perception on how much we can do for others and how much it means we can do a difference. But we also saw it in the actual numbers, both in unique uses and in time spent. This is something the audiences want. And it, but it's not just about writing stories or creating TV segments. We have uh, included and RK answers your questions in a lot of our stories, where our readers get the opportunity to send in their questions to the Prime Minister, for instance, and we try to include that in as many stories as we can. And we try to fight polarization, as I said, was a part of our def uh, the definition. We have um, quite often, when we do debates, uh, the opportunity for the audiences to answer questions. And we have also decreased our presence quite significantly on social media to try to take the debate home to our own platforms where we can manage it a lot more better than we do in the uh, comment sections. And it's also about the perspective we take on the debates. I'm going to show you an example here on how you choose an angle and how that can matter. And in our main debate program, we actually did two openings. And that was like this. Og dette er et så betent politisk spørsmål at jeg har bevilget meg to forskjellige åpninger av debatten. Her er den første. Velkommen til debatten som skal handle om at kommersielle konsern, eid fra skatteparadiser og av investeringsfond, skuffer inn skattepenger som skal gå til velferd. De som driver med internhandel, konsernbidrag og tilbakeholdende overskudd, vet du. Og de som blir mange millioner nærer, ja, kanskje til og med milliardærer på offentlig tilskudd. Vi kan kalle dem velferdsprofitører. Det var den ene åpningen. Her er den andre. Velkommen til debatten som skal handle om de private som stiller opp når det er pandemi med testing og vaksinering om de private som er på plass over natta med asylmottak for ukrainere, og de private som passer barna våre, vi, sånn at vi andre kan gå på jobb, som får barnevernet til å gå rundt. De samme private som venstresiden vil strupe og kaste på dør. Så det viser hvor mye den angle av historien kan mene til en debatt. Men tilbake til spørsmålet, er det bare happy stories? No. 
investigative journalism can also be constructive. And one example we did quite recently is this story. This is Lily. Uh, we did an investigative piece on uh, the neglect that elderly in Norway experience, uh, both at home and in care homes. And the first story, to be quite honest, it wasn't much hope in that. But then we followed up what had happened since we did our reporting. And then I'm happy to say that this has happened. Lily has a better life and a new best friend. So part of being constructive is to keep uh, researching your story and see what happens after your first story is published. So uh, I thought I'd share some tips and then uh, some keys to success to uh, wrap this up. When you do your research, remember to ask yourself, is anyone looking for a solution? And if someone is... Oops, let's see. If someone is uh, looking for a solution, ask your experts, now what? Where's the hope in that? But remember to also be critical of the experts. Try to really find uh, areas where there's room for improvement. Change the angle. If one in four uh, are suffering or having problems, maybe focus on the 75% uh, who are doing okay. Explain better. Don't take for granted that everyone knows the context of the story or uh, the words you use, like use uh, better language and explain what is actually happening. Try to show the most nuanced version of the world. Create a healthy debate. Don't always look for the two polar uh, opposites. Try to find a good uh, space in between. And ask yourself, do we, do we leave the audience with the right impression of the world? What we think has been the keys to success in NRK is that we defined constructive journalism as a part of our main strategy, but we dedicated resources to working with this in the beginning. Someone needs to um, really focus on it in order to get it out into the whole organization. So find your ambassadors. Who are your Caroline and Ingrid? And give them freedom to explore and involve them in the goal setting. Then include everyone. Experiment with new formats and ways of telling the story. And remember, changing habits takes time. So we need to work on this and stay in the process for quite some time to be able to see the results. And I hope that a lot of you get inspired now to start doing this so that we can be more people looking at the world with both eyes. Thank you. And now we are thrilled to open the floor for the last Q&A of the day and ready to ask tough questions. Our moderator, mm -hmm. Zora Medev, you can take it from here. Thank you very much. Um, we got, until now, one question from the audience and obviously anonymous. I wanted to ask you to write your name and the name of your company before when you ask over the application, but uh, I'm, uh, I will lie if I say that I didn't expect that nobody will ask something, because um, on the table here I have the third edition of the Ulrich Hagerup's group, uh, book, uh, Constructive News, which had been published in 2014, but uh, it means that first edition had been published more than 10 years ago. And uh, uh, Christina, you used the word tomorrow in your presentation, but uh, even this concept is old 10 uh, years, uh, we are still talking about the, our future and about the future concept. Yes. Why? Yeah, and there were people before Ulrich Hogerup as well talking about this, so you're absolutely right. It's, nothing, it's not a new concept. Uh, and I think that it's a proof that every type of 
cultural change takes a lot of time, and it does not start by itself. It takes a lot of effort to change habits and to change uh, the way we are used to work. Uh, and I think it goes for this as well. Renzo from Netherlands. Thank you, Renzo, for your question. How can this form of journalism still be critical? Are journalists the ones who need to find solutions? Uh, this is a very good question because it puts a finger on one of the um, two this of is them. The question from the beginning of the concept. <laughs> That's very good. The oldest one. <laughs> yeah, but because it's there is a myth that constructive journalism isn't critical, and that is just simply not true. <clears throat> it's not a happy story about something that ma makes you feel good. It's about just putting uh, the perspective on the stories that you already find relevant. Uh, like if you are, uh, like in Sweden, we have a huge problem with, uh, with uh, shootings and gang criminality. That is, of course, a very important story to cover. But putting the constructive uh, perspective on it is to search for the solutions. What areas have succeeded in uh, stopping young people from being recruited into gang criminality? That's putting just another angle. And then you can use that to be critical towards another area or municipality. Why haven't you done this? So, And that is much more difficult for a politician, for instance, to, to answer, since it obviously is possible. Marcus wanted yeah, to... Yeah, it's not the, the journalist that's supposed to, to come up with the solutions, as in the questions. It's uh, other people who, who have thought about this and maybe have a solution that we cover and uh, tell our, or our audience, because the solution and the problem is equally true. We are uh, aiming to, to tell the truth, I suppose, and the solution is equally true as the problem. But we always report on just the problem and leave the solution out. Uh, and, and now with this, we, we are just um, uh, telling uh, the audience that there might be a, a, a solution, but we're critical to the solution as well. Yeah, Ida? Yeah, now, uh, as you were saying, I think it's uh, actually more uh, of an honest way of telling the whole story. If you focus solely on the problems, you'll just be spinning in a hamster wheel without getting anywhere. And we have sort of a responsibility as public broadcasters to help people uh, make a change in their lives. I will read the second question too. How complicated it was to persuade your employees, journalists, uh, at first, uh, they should look for constructive angle as it takes more effort, more time, more means. Yeah, I can answer that because uh, I, I work closely with my employees, of course, and we've implemented this. Uh, it wasn't that hard, I should say, because uh, uh, if you go to yourself, if you, if you encounter a problem, what do you do? The first thing you think about. How can I solve this problem? That's the first thing. You, 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 you don't just lie, lie down and die. You, you, you try to find a solution immediately. And um, actually, it hasn't been that hard because we, we uh, have implemented this uh, at our editorial uh, meetings and so on. We, we speak about uh, this as uh, just one of all perspectives that we are uh, working with. It, and it's not harder to report on solutions than to report on problems. Uh, it is interesting. Uh, Hagerup uh, used first time the case of Africa. We saw and met yesterday the colleague from South Africa talking us how they trying to engage young audience with a with some news and solution news and to react on the real life and their problems in uh, their country. And uh, because the most common uh, presentation of Africa in our uh, perspectives, our perception, is that actually it is poor, dirty, okay, some lions and elephants are going on and we can go to safari, etc., etc. But actually, they have a very uh, uh, 
rich social groups in some countries. They have also uh, very high buildings in the capitals. 90% of all African governments had been elected on the free general elections. It's not the tribe war <laughs> to get the government or king or anybody else. That means they are on the very formal level, very similar to us. Are we savages in that case? How we can see this perspective? How we can turn our uh, angle of view on the world around us? That's, that's, that's the main uh, problem. But nowadays, actually, we are not asking about Africa. We have the war in Ukraine. We have a, a lot of problems uh, who are much, much closer to our everyday life and our happiness uh, and everything else in, in this case. Idana. You yeah, I just wanted to touch on what you said about the perspective of Africa. The, they did a survey in Norway asking about um, how many people uh, you think live in extreme poverty, and if that number had uh, decreased, increased, or stayed mostly the same uh, the last 20 years. And 80%, 80, percent, 80 uh, get it wrong in Norway. They think it has yeah. increased, uh, while it actually has decreased quite a lot. And then we did the story about that, uh, which quite simply was three ways the world is doing better than you thought. And I think that's a, a huge part of our responsibility to actually showcase that and try to change people's mind. Anything to add? Yeah, and also sometimes you sound a little bit like Hans Rosling now, <laughs> which is a nice uh, comparison. But uh, we see also that even journalists uh, tend to have a misconception of the reality. And, and I mean, we shouldn't. Uh, so it's absolutely to be... To, to be more nuanced and correct. Uh, can I add something? Um, it's, uh, as we, we saw here, uh, people are actively avoiding news. So we have to take this very, very serious. This is, this is something that we have to do. We have to be more solution-based. Not because we want it or something we just came up with, because the audience is demanding it. The, the audience is, is leaving us. And if they are, we should listen to them. Uh, I have two additional questions from the audience. Uh, Carl Goran Larsson from NRK asked, uh, uh, it is human to find the problems and to complain about what is not working. Does hope and solution-based journalism reach as many viewers as traditional news? I think this is a really good question as well, because as I mentioned, we have heard, as you have as well, of course, uh, that audience have, said, have complained that our news is so negative. But before, they still clicked on the bad news. So there wasn't really before evidence in the traffic or audience uh, surveys that, that they actually consumed uh, more constructive news. But that is changing, that we can see that now. Uh, so I think it's, uh, and this is also, of course, a very relevant thing to, to, to consider when you are uh, ch choosing what to cover and how to cover it. Any additional? Or uh, I have a question for Ida Anna, anonymous. Ida Anna mentioned that the young audience seems to like constructive journalism. What kind of effects do Marcus and Christina see in Sweden and why? Oh, could you please repeat the question? Uh, what kind of effects of effects. constructive journal effects okay. uh, do Marcus and Christina see in Sweden, and why? Um, the audience uh, is still suspicious. Uh, it, uh, it's a very uh, wide question. It, it's hard to, to, to see actual effects now. Uh, as we, uh, we are implementing this perspective at the SVT uh, from the highest level in, in the company, and we, we hope uh, regarding uh, the service that are, are showing that people actively avoid the news, especially in the young uh, gener generation, um, we, we hope that uh, it will uh, change. The, the, um, it, it's hard to say, actually, uh, because of course, negative news, disasters, crimes, and so on, people still click on that, mm. of course. 
Um, and also, we should be uh, honest and say that that the the <laughs> the effect in our news coverage has also taken a long time to to I mean really be implemented, and uh, and it's only now that when we measure the number of constructive stories that we see a rise, because even if we have talked about it, it have taken a long time. So now I uh, think the recent uh, measurement with local news, we, we measure every uh, three times a year, um, the number of constructive stories in in in-depth items is now for over 44%. Yeah. Uh, and but that has taken a long time, and we are. It will probably dip again. Uh, so it's. I think it's early to have any conclusions about the effects. We can see, however, that trust is still on a very high level for public service media. Now, um, I just thought I'd share. We're doing a different project at NRK at the moment, trying to uh, better uh, publish our local uh, stories on our main site. And what we see when we get um, audiences feedback there is that there is a demand to get more positive news. They thought they would get even more positive stories uh, in that project, which wasn't really a constructive project to begin with. So we see a demand for it in our audience. I find. I found one good reason why we maybe need to implement constructive journalism in our newsrooms. Maybe it will save our jobs in future. Why we are needed in our societies? Do you have the answer on that question? How we are similar or not similar to all commercial news all around on all possible platforms we are following nowadays and especially younger audiences are followed. This is, this is, I think, very, very good questions. If anyone has better answer than me, please raise your hands. No. Uh, another question about uh, not only constructive journalism, because constructive journalism is a very tricky term. Uh, why I have to be constructive to politicians, why I have to be constructive to the people committed uh, corruption, let's say, or crime or anything else. It is very obvious. That it, it, is, it is the questioning or answering on the first side. But in the basic journalistic formula, formula 5W plus H, we have one very important question. Why? All people want to know why something had happened. And actually, constructive journalism is seeking for the answer so deep until you find all possible answers on that question, why something had happened. And it is many times related with very, uh, very usual, very everyday life, you know, traffic accidents. How I can avoid traffic accidents in the next street? Why my, how my children can avoid traffic accident in the, next, in, in the corner round. Morley in the 80s researched the family watching of television in London and find that men and women are equally watching crime stories on television, but with two different motives. Men to be masculine, you know, to be jacks. Women, to protect children and family. Two completely different angles, but the same goal, to complete the basic unit, very traditional unit in the society of uh, very strong working class culture also, to prevent the basic unit, give me my security, my everyday perspectives. How much of time you are thinking about that? How often? How often <laughs> we think about uh, the, the, our view of the world, or uh, yeah, yeah, all, all the time. <laughs> I think yeah. uh, if if we look at journalism, uh, I can speak for Sweden. Uh, the product journalism 
hasn't actually evolved very much. Um, if, you, if you look back, uh, say, five, ten years, the, the technical aspects of our work has changed uh, immensely. We are now uh, working online, internet changed everything. Uh, we are, our journalism is consumed basely uh, through the, the cell, uh, your cell phone, your mobile phone, and uh, everything has changed. The journalists have had, had to adapt to a new reality. But when it comes to our product that we're selling, journalism, it hasn't evolved at all. I should say, Seen in Sweden, seen, uh, we had um, in the 60s, we had something, you know, w w when the journalists stopped being polite and so on and, and started, you know, being more hard against uh, politicians and, and, and be more critical. That, then we saw a, a change in journalism. But since then, it has, uh, nothing has happened. So this is a, a product development of journalism to have this constructive perspective, I think. But how about the talk shows? We saw the case of uh, an interview with the Prime Minister in Sweden, and this is an interesting uh, uh, case because we have a lot of uh, talk shows, political talk shows and debates on television, uh, which are arenas. Gladiators, lions, fight each other, beat each other, try to win. Even you yeah. hunt, but never mind, try to win. Blood, we need to see something dramatical. But in 2000, 23 years ago, Ida Mayer from uh, Dutch High School of Journalism made the research uh, co-financed by European Union from 1997 to 2000 about debate and dialogue in the talk shows on the public service media televisions. And final the difference, the, the most important difference is that in the dialogue talk between people who are thinking from the start different about the same issue, you are asking or seeking for solution. Mm. How close we are in our views about the problem and not how to win our opponent, political enemy, let's say, or something like that. In usual debates, we can see on our televisions nowadays, that means quarter of century later, uh, we are still uh, uh, can see more arenas than, uh, than actually dialogue between people who had been elected, finally, to rule our lives on better way. That is one of the perspectives also for the public service. We, we uh, 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 heard the colleagues from Ukraine this morning talking about investigative journalism in the war conditions. They still know how they can to control, as watchdogs, the problem of the normal political life in the country, even the country is in the war. And that is our DNA, as Idana said, actually. Have you anything to add? I think that it's also interesting to reflect on the fact that journalism hasn't evolved that mm. much, but also our brain hasn't evolved that much over the, the years. Uh, we are still very um, prone to react more strongly on threats mm. than on other information. And, and this has been a really good tool for news media uh, from the start, that you attract attention by showing something that is th threat th threatening, and also conflict is threatening. But we have to remember that over the last 20 years, uh, the, the media or the environment is changing dramatically. So uh, as opposed to before, when you had one alarm uh, waking you up in, in the evening when you or in the morning when you read the morning paper, or in the evening when you look at the news show, now you are constantly bombarded with alarms. And, and, uh, and a response to that might have been that we have augmented the threat level in our reporting, but now to a level where people are so 
they, they, they can't, the, the brain has to just shut down. <laughs> you need to rest from it. So I think it's, it's really important to look at the, the, the context where we are acting and think about that. Uh, I have uh, three more questions from the audience. I'd like to ask you. Uh, uh, yes? Okay. Okay, I will put together two questions of Daniela Drastata from HRT. First, Zora and I can't agree with be constructive to keep jobs at public service media, although I do it for personal reason, to make society better, to live healthy world to our kids. And uh, additional question to this, I just wonder how constructive journalism could move more to the south of Europe. What's your thinking? To the south of Europe? Um, isn't the south of Europe constructive? Uh, Okay. I will try to answer with the, uh, with the answer of uh, Tune Kunst, our former president. Uh, ten years ago, on the first master class in Dublin, she told us if Norway fell back on its back, the northern part of Norway will fall on Rome. But, but, but it's how constructive journalism comes to uh, south. Just to conclude this uh, about solution-based, from my perspective uh, as an editor, uh, it's not hard. It's very easy. You can start doing this tomorrow when you come home. Uh, you just have to widen your scope of perception and, and report on other things that are also equally true as the problems. Thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you very much to the host and thank you very much to the audience.